history between 1947 and 1971, what happened then, is actually not very well understood by Bangladeshis or anybody. I mean, we seem to have excised this period from our mind. And in a sense, the history of Bangladesh begins in 1971. As far as the official you know, discourse is concerned, we see um, to the extent that we don't even celebrate the departure of the British from India. So the Pakistanis and the Indians celebrate the 14th of August or the 15th of August. We do not. So we were not independent until 1971. And there is a kind of uh, uh, failure to have any kind of rational discourse about what happened between 47 and 71. So as an economist trying to understand our current um, predicaments and where we are going, I think we need to recover this period of history and perhaps make sense of it. It's particularly important for a number of reasons. Because you can't actually separate the history of 71 from the history of 47 for a large number of reasons. The most glaring of which is that the map of Bangladesh was not constructed in 71. It was constructed in 47. So if you have no understanding of what happened in 47, you can't, yeah, you can't explain why we have these borders. And so the discourse that we have today about 71 as our independence day, the most important thing about statehood is borders. And if you don't have a discourse about where your borders came from and why they exist, then we have this endless confusion that we continue to have in Bangladesh of who we are and why does the country exist. It is really a fundamental question which has to be uh, answered. As Ahmadullah was saying, we have an incredible amount of political conflicts in Bangladesh based on historical narratives, which are partly each of them true, but are each based on large amount of falsehood and, and construction and misconstruction, which is a source of unnecessary conflicts. And not just unnecessary conflicts, I think they are actually much more serious in terms of how we define our national um, agendas and our sovereignty and our future and our relationships with our neighbors, all of these things really come down to a progressive understanding, a humanistic understanding of where we are and who we are. And we don't have that in It's quite stunning, actually. We don't have that basic consensus amongst uh, people. The two narratives which inform Bangladeshi discourse today, both of these narratives are completely false. Right? So the first narrative is that somehow East Pakistan was a colony of West Pakistan from 47 to 71. We were, we were colonized, so the British colony was replaced by a Pakistani colony. And then in 71, we had a war of liberation to achieve independence. That's why independence dates from 71, not 47. So this is one discourse. And you can easily identify which kinds of political forces have that discourse. The second discourse is equally wrong. That, or, or partial, I mean, none, none of this is wrong. They are both partial. The second partial discourse is that Pakistan was a fine country, but it faced an Indian conspiracy to break it up right from the very beginning. And Bengali politicians walked into this trap in 1971, and then Bangladesh became some kind of dependent state of India, and it is under the control of India. So, this is an alternative discourse which runs through our politics. Basically, I'm going to argue that actually neither of this is correct. They're partially true and maybe not even true at all. And by having our national discourse around a misunderstanding and absent history, we end up with wasting a lot of energy fighting pointless battles, political battles in which people die and kill because they don't really know the facts. The reality is, uh, I'm going to argue, is much more complex but also much more progressive and uplifting, and if we can understand the history, we can be proud of it, right? And the real history, I think, which one can um, see if one reads the, the, the documents in a neutral way, is that both the partitions of 47 and 71 were not actually driven by the Muslim Bengalis. This was not the primary agenda. The primary agenda in neither in the 47 partition of Bengal or the 71 breakup of Pakistan was not driven by us. What they were actually fighting for, what the Muslim Bengalis were actually fighting for in both these conflicts, was to exercise their rights. And here is the fundamental problem of Muslim Bengal or East Bengal, is that for demographic reasons, the Muslim Bengalis were a majority in Bengal 
in 47, and the Muslim minorities are also a majority in Pakistan in 71. So in both cases, what you have, the fundamental political problem is that the Muslim minorities are the majority, but economically, educationally, bureaucratically, militarily, they were the weaker uh, side in both these conflicts. So in both these conflicts, what was happening was a conflict between an elite which was not Bengali Muslim. The elite in 1947 was upper caste Hindu. And the elite in, 40, in 71 was non Bengali Muslim <coughs> from West Pakistan. The elites were a minority, but they were more powerful. They had the economic, military, bureaucratic, and other levers of power in their hand. The Muslim Bengalis of East Bengal in both these conflicts simply wanted to exercise their democratic rights which resulted in a crisis. Because what happened was that the poor majority got voted into power in both cases, and the rich minority said, we don't want this. And in both cases, the terms of staying together were so unequal that it couldn't happen. And you have two partitions. Now, once you understand that history, a lot begins to make sense in what's going on in Bangladesh. Basically, what I'm going to um, argue is to go back to the history of 47 and 71 and say why these two partitions are so divisive in our political psyche, you know, because we are trying to construct a story which is actually not true. And the story we are trying to construct is that we wanted these partitions, we, and somehow we were the instigators and we are the ones who won something that we wanted. Actually, the problem is that that story doesn't fit. It's very, it's very easy to undermine the story, whichever of the discourses you have. And another um, lecture that I um, gave in this group was a very detailed history of, of the partition of Bengal from 1905 to 1947, which is another story, which I don't have time to go into today. But actually, you need to know that to understand the subsequent um, story. So these two are all part of one continuous discourse. Um, but maybe I need to spend two minutes going to that previous history because some of you may not have been at my earlier lecture when I discussed that, uh, the partition of Bengal. Because if you don't understand the partition of Bengal, you can't understand what happened um, after 47. The Pakistan movement is understood both by Indians, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis as a conflict between the two nation theory of the Muslim League, saying Muslims and Hindus are two nations, and the secular discourse coming from the Congress, which said all Indians are citizens and we should all be together. Okay? That's how you understand this conflict. But that is not actually, when you look at the details of it, is not substantiated. And there is a very interesting set of three articles which came out last July in the London Review of Books by a historian called Perry Anderson. And I think everyone needs to read these three pieces. Because what Perry Anderson does is he goes into the historical detail of the debate between Congress and Muslim League and blows up this dichotomy between two nation theory on the one hand versus uh, secularism on the other. The fundamental problem is this that there were historical deep seated divisions between. Muslims, Hindus, and within Hindus of Hindus of different castes. By insisting on a first past proposed system with power centralized reasoning, Nehru and the Congress were permanently excluding the 30% of the population who were Muslims from power, but also another 30% who were lower caste from power. And Nehru's fight was not just with Jinnah, it was also with the leader of the untouchables, Ambedkar who was in many ways a much more strong critic of Nehru than Jinnah. This is all forgotten history. Now, what happens in the 1930s, the Muslim League has two sets of demands. I hope this is not too complicated for you, right? So how do you ensure Muslim representation in, in India with a first past the post voting system? You know the problem of the first past the post voting system, right? The 30% minority will get 2% representation. So what, there were two strategies that Jinnah had to ensure Muslim representation. One was proportional representation, right? which was called in India separate electorates. 
Congress was always against separate electorates for all kinds of reasons, some good, some bad. But the second response of the, of the Muslim League is one that is not really well understood. The second response of the Muslim League emerged in the 1930s and 1940s when it became clear that the Muslims of India were hugely concentrated in the East and the West. Now, if the Muslims are hugely concentrated in the East and the West, two-thirds of the Muslims were in these two pockets, then actually, instead of proportional representation, you could have another solution, which is in the areas where Muslims were a majority and would therefore have, through the first past the whole system, form governments, you should give real powers to these regions. That's another way of getting Muslim representation. So you have devolution of power to the regions instead of separate electorates. Now, this part of the story we have completely forgotten. But it comes to the crunch in 1946 when in the last minute the British come with a plan called the Cabinet Mission Plan. And the Cabinet Mission Plan offers India exactly this. It offers India federal union with real power devolved to the east and the west and to the center. And here is something which no one knows or wants to know. In 1946, one year before Pakistan, Jinnah stands up and says, I don't want Pakistan. He tears up his map of Pakistan and says, I don't want this moth eaten map, direct quote from Jinnah. I want to stay in India. I accept the cabinet mission plan. How many people know this? No one knows this. I mean, the, so it's not part of the discourse of India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh. Two nation theory was a bargaining chip that Nehru, uh, Jinnah was using. When he got the evolution, he accepted. Number one. Number two, the Muslims in Punjab and Bengal never voted for the Muslim League because from 1936, when limited electorates were granted by the British and limited elections began from 1936 onwards, because of their majority in, in Punjab and Bengal, Muslims were already ruling Punjab and Bengal. So from 1936, the governments of Bengal and Punjab, I'm talking about United Bengal and United Punjab, not Bangladesh, whole of Bengal, was ruled by Muslims. Who was Fazlul Haq, who was Saravarti, who were the chief ministers of Bengal in the 1930s and 1940s were Bengali Muslim peasants. Okay? So, the Bengali Muslims didn't want the Muslim League and the Punjabi Muslims didn't want the Muslim League. In Bengal, the ruling government was Fishat Prajapati. In Punjab, it was a unionist party, not the Muslim League. These were Muslim parties, but not the Muslim League, because the Muslims in these areas did not want partition, did not want separation. They were already ruling. Why would you want to partition something that you were already ruling? It is stupid. So the Muslims of Bengal did not want partition. Now, we in Bangladesh do not understand this, do not know this, do not have a discourse on this. In the 1930s and 1940s, who wanted partition of Bengal? were the Hindu minority who felt threatened because they were the elites, they were the landlords, they were the bureaucrats, they were the cultural elite. Suddenly you have these uneducated peasants from East Bengal forming the government in Calcutta. And you are supposed to be ruled by these plebeian people from there who are not washed, not clean, not educated, and they are the government. But if you are an upper caste Hindu, this is nightmare. So what happens then, I'll keep the questions for afterwards because otherwise I will not finish, I have a lot to say. So what happens then is that the Hindus of Bengal insist on a constitution for India where power is centralized in Delhi because that is their only way of ensuring that the local government will not oppress them, abolish zamindari, redistribute land, create jobs for new people and so on. So they want to concentrate power in and so the biggest supporter for Nehru in rejecting the cabinet mission plan and throwing the whole plan into the are the upper caste Bengali Hindus and Sikhs and others from the, the Northwest. Okay, so the cabinet mission plan is rejected not by the Muslim League, it's rejected by Congress and by Nehru. At that point in 1946, for the first time, the Muslims of Bengal panic. They panic because they realize that, my God, you know, Nehru wants to keep power in Delhi. 
We might be a local majority, but we will have no power. Power will be in Delhi. In Delhi, the Hindus will have 80% of the seats. That's or 90% of the seats. And if all decisions are made in Delhi, this Calcutta is useless as a power base. For the first and last time in history, in 1946, the Muslims of Bengal voted for the Muslim League en masse. The Muslim League sweeps the polls, and then something really interesting happens. I'm sorry to go into this history, but it's extremely interesting, and I'll just take two minutes before I come to my main story. After the Muslim League wins in 1946, the Bengal Muslim League still doesn't want partition. They are ruling Bengal. Why do you want to partition Bengal? Nehru then sits with Mountbatten and writes a set of rules which ensures partition, and the rules are the following. Nehru, who has his whole life opposed separate electorates and Hindus and Muslims voting separately, on this occasion convinces Mountbatten that the rule of voting in the last meeting of the Bengal Assembly, Hindus and Muslims will vote separately. And if either group votes for partition, Bengal will be partitioned. So the Muslims, who are not all Muslim League, vote. On mass, they vote against the partition of Bengal. Now, this is so contrary to our popular understanding of two nation theory Muslim League want to partition. How many people know this? That the Muslim League voted against the partition of Bengal. And they are the majority. And had they voted together, the Muslim League votes to prevent the partition of Bengal would have carried the day. The Hindu minority votes separately and they vote en masse to partition Bengal. And according to the rules set by Mount Bell, Bengal was partitioned not because the Muslims wanted it, not because the Muslim League wanted it, but because the Hindu minority wanted it. This is historical fact and historical record. Unfortunate fact is we do not know this. We do not read history. We do not engage with our history. We do not talk about our history. So we think that the Muslim League somehow partitioned Bengal and the two nation theory was imposed on Bengal and somehow the Punjab is colonized. Punjabi did not colonize us in 1947. Something terrible happened afterwards, which I am coming to. But we have to first understand that East Pakistan was not a colony of West Pakistan. And the support for Pakistan was strongest in East Pakistan because all the Muslims in East Pakistan, or what became East Pakistan, all the Muslims of Bengal virtually unanimously voted for the Muslim League in 1946, which is why the Muslim League was able to form the cabinet of Bengal, the pre-partition Bengal, in 1946 was a Muslim League cabinet, and in Punjab, even in 1946, the Muslim League was unable to form a cabinet. The Unionist Party formed the cabinet in Punjab. So the idea that the Muslim League was a Punjabi construction and was imposed on us, is historically completely wrong. Bengal was more Muslim League than Punjab in 1946. But both Bengal and Punjab had no alternative because the minorities did not want to give power to the majority. The minority wanted to keep power in Delhi. And if power was going to be in Delhi, there was no point in staying in India. The rest is history. But the second story is also wrong. So now I want back to the post for seven period. It's very important to understand why the pre-47 history has been wrong, but the post-47 history is also wrong. Because those who say that, therefore, Pakistan is a justified and justifiable um, construction, and it was India who then seemed and, uh, and uh, manipulated to break up Pakistan, is also partially true, but not correct. Because if East Pakistan had wanted to stay with West Pakistan, there is no way India could have been invaded and split from. There was a deeper problem within Pakistan, which of course India exploited. Of course India took advantage of, but India could not have done it if there hadn't been a problem. So we need to understand what was the problem. And so you can't blame the Indians for 71, just as you can't blame the Muslim League for 47. What was the problem? The problem was that Pakistan started off as a very unfortunate hinterland of India. 
both the West and the East, were they economically, educationally, and even I would dare to say culturally, less developed parts of India. They were the agricultural hinterland. Both Punjab and Sindh and Baluchistan and Eastern Bengal were the agrarian areas. There was virtually no industry. There were virtually no capitalists. There was virtually very limited education. And I will give you some indicators of this. But of the two, East Bengal was even less developed than Western Punjab and uh, 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 what became West Pakistan. So, both East and West Pakistan were underdeveloped relative to the rest of India. But the eastern part of Pakistan was even underdeveloped relative to West Pakistan. It's unbelievable how impoverished this place was uh, in 1947. Muslims in undivided Bengal were 55% of the population. Undivided Bengal did not include Sivet, by the way. Sinet till 1947 was a part of Assam. If you go back to 19, pre-1905, then all of Sinet, all of the northeast states, all of East Pakistan, Bangladesh, and West Bengal, and parts of Bihar and Urissa were part of the Bengal Suba, which was the old Mughal province. Right? At that time, of course, Sinet was part of Bengal, but Sinet was part of Bengal like the Naga and Mizos were part of Bengal, and um, the Biharis were part of Bengal. After the first partition was reversed in 1911, no, no time to discuss that, right? Sinet became part of Assam, and from 1911 to 1947, it wasn't part of Bengal. So what was Bengal was Bangladesh minus Sinet and West Bengal. And that part of Bengal, Muslims were 55% of the population. Therefore, when elections began in the 1930s, the Muslims formed the government because they were a uh, slight majority, but, and here is the problem, the Muslims were basically peasants. There was no significant Muslim landlord class, business class, uh, administrative class, anything. Okay? We are basically, all of us, descendants largely of peasants. And so education is in Bangladesh, two or three generations old, in most cases. I mean, there are a few families which are older than that, but by and large, we are a very young nation in terms of the transition from a peasant society to a modern society, the transition is still going on. Largely, Bangladesh is still a peasant country. In the capital, Calcutta, the population of Muslims was 25%. Okay? And most of these Muslims in Calcutta were at the lower rounds of the urban economy service sector, menial jobs, and so on. The administrative class, the cultural class, the literary class, lawyers, were basically not just Hindus, but upper class Hindus, who were maybe 10% or 5% of the population of Bangladesh. Upper class Hindus, not just Brahmins, but Kayasts and others um, who, in Bengal, the number of Brahmins is, is small, but there's a significant upper class um, Hindu group provided the elite leadership. And yet, this population, which was such a small uh, minority, minority in terms of any skilled jobs, education, were forming the government because that's what electoral democracy means. <coughs> in Calcutta, there are no Muslims in the elites, but the government is led by Muslims. And then you have this whole elite administration, which is Hindu upper caste, and then lots of really poor Muslims. But the poor Muslims 25% in Qatar. Dhaka, which we see now as the capital of Bangladesh, is a major city in East Bengal, the situation is hardly different. What was the percentage of Muslims in Dhaka? In 1947, 40% of the population of Dhaka is Muslim. And this is a really poor view. 60% of the population in Dhaka in 1947 is caste, upper caste Hindus, the traders, the merchants, the business people. Can anyone imagine this now? I mean, the time, I mean, Dhaka was a Hindu city. Yeah? Till 1947. 85% of urban property in Dhaka was owned by Hindus. So even that 40% who was living were mostly living in Hindu property. 
So the assets of Tata were not owned by Muslims. The trade of Tata was not done by Muslims. The business of Tata, the, the University of Tata did not have many Muslim teachers. Newspapers did not have any Muslim um, journalists. We forget all this, right? So this is why the idea that this Hindu elite would be ruled by Muslims was complete anathema. They could not imagine this. Unthinkable. So I've already said that. There were very few elite Bengali Muslims. Okay. There was a tiny, tiny super elite Bengali Muslims who were the aristocracy, so Nawab family and all that. And they were of questionable Bengaliness. They spoke Urdu, they had other issues. Right? So you have a very elite top, you know, Muslim elite, aristoc aristocracy, then the whole administrative elites are Hindu, and then you have a Muslim peasantry, which is 55% of the explosive mix of class and ethnicity. Now this explosive mix of class and ethnicity is what resulted in 47. But now you have another explosive mix of class and ethnicity, which is post 47, you carve out of the peasant part of Bengal something called East Pakistan, which is basically peasants. And once again you find that the Muslim peasants of Bengal are the majority of Pakistan. And you probably know this. How do you manage this? Of the 82 senior Indian civil service officers who opted for Pakistan in 1947, only one is Bengali. Okay, imagine this, right? You are setting up a new country called Pakistan. Your top civil servants, who are the Indian civil servants, you are the elite of the elite, the Indian civil servants. 81 are non Bengali. One is Bengali, but Bengalis are the majority of the population. So who is going to administer East Pakistan? Who is going to run this place if you don't have the basic skills, education, and technical capacities to do this? Obviously, you import non-Bengali administrators, and then you feel angry. How are these people ruling us? We just fought and got Pakistan to become independent, and now we have Bihari and Punjabi and UP Wallas in the administrative service at the highest levels. Okay, this is one. At the same time, Pakistan as a whole is underdeveloped. It has virtually no industry, it feels threatened immediately from impending collapse. All of the industry of both Bengal and Punjab happen to be in the Indian parts of the country. So the all the industry of Bengal is in the Calcutta belt. East Bengal is simply su supplying the raw materials. All the industry of Punjab is in the Indian belt. And, in, and Punjab was the supplier of cotton to the cotton textile mills of what is now Bombay. Okay, so these are the raw material suppliers. Suddenly they find they are independent, they have no industry, they have none. What do they do? So the whole history of the early Pakistan in the 1950s is how to accelerate industrialization at the fastest possible rate create new capitalists and create new productive enterprises at the fastest possible rate to stave off an imminent collapse of the economy and collapse back into India on terms that Nehru wanted. Remember, Nehru in 1946, 1947, and this is in Perry Anderson's three pieces, you, know, you must read it, everyone should look for Perry Anderson's articles in the New Red, uh, not uh, yeah, yeah, London Review of Books, in the London Review. Uh, review of books last July. Nehru actually says Pakistan will not last more than two years. They will collapse, they will come back to India, and then they will come back on our terms. So, for the Pakistani leadership, it was imperative to not let that happen, not make the economy collapse. So, you have the, the dual problem. You have to have top house economic development, which means huge amount of government control and subsidies and government push for industry. At the same time, you have the problem that the majority of the population is in East Pakistan and they are so behind in terms of their technical skills and their development of capitalism and development of entrepreneurship, they are not likely to be the immediate beneficiaries of these policies. So you have a problem. How do you, how do you accelerate industrialization when the majority of the population is really, really 
backward. And a further problem, not only is East Pakistan more backward, all of the assets that Pakistan got in terms of human capital, bureaucratic, military, and cultural, the people who are in mainland India who then opt to come to Pakistan, most of them are Urdu speakers who find West Pakistan culturally more close to them and to go and locate in Karachi. So the industrialists, the traders, the mer merchants and bankers, and the bureaucrats who are in India do not come and settle in East Pakistan. East Pakistan gets some working class Muslims from Bihar and other parts of India. But the elite Muslims go to West Pakistan because they feel culturally closer. Because they're Urdu speaking and Urdu is closer to Punjabi and, and so on, and not close to, to Bengal. That further increases the human capital of West Pakistan. They have the administrative and the bureaucratic and capital um, capitalist class locating there. And now you have to push industrialization. Where do you put the money? So Pakistan immediately faces a huge crisis. And the crisis is increased because the four provinces of West Pakistan together have fewer people than the one East Pakistan. So the population disparity is huge. And that's why from day one, Pakistan can't have democracy. So you know, people have this huge kind of debate about how come India was democracy and Pakistan never... It's very easy to explain. <coughs> democracy in Pakistan in 1947 was in, not impossible, it was just extremely difficult because the poorest people far away from the country, in the East, basically peasants were the majority, and all the industrial capital, bureaucratic knowledge, technical skills were in the West, who were a minority. The same problem that happened in 1947 with the Hindu upper caste now happened with the non bengali Muslims who were now the upper caste, who were in somewhere else, who felt threatened by how the hell are we going to manage this place if these peasants rule us. Answer? don't have democracy. So, after many, many attempts at having a constitution which would balance these two things, balance the economic interests with the political interests, constitution making fails in Pakistan by 1958. For 11 years, there is a constitutional debate in which the East Pakistanis participate fully. So, the idea that East Pakistan was, was colonized is completely wrong. East Pakistan was at the heart of the constitutional debates, People like Saravati and so on were at the heart of this debate, Muhammad Ali Bobra, heart of this debate. There were prime ministers from East Pakistan who were the prime ministers of Pakistan during this period. Okay? Problem was they failed to come to an agreement. It wasn't that we were colonized, we failed to come to an agreement. We failed to come to an agreement which would balance the interests of East and West Pakistan. And that resulted in the military takeover of 1958 because of this fundamental mismatch. The closest we came ever in Pakistan to an agreement was in the 1950s with Muhammad Ali Bogra's plan of having a balance of seats in the two houses of, of parliament together with the lower house having an East Pakistan majority and the upper house having a West Pakistan majority representing the fact that West Pakistan had more states and East Pakistan was just one state East Pakistan had more people, West Pakistan had less people, so balance them out in a state's house and a people's house so that the two together would have parity. This is the closest Pakistan came to a constitutional agreement, but it didn't work. After the failure of the Muhammad Ali Bogra plan, there was only the military solution. The military takes power in 1958, we know what happens, Ayub comes to power, and East Pakistan is not going backward concentration of power in, in the West, and this imperative that we have to accelerate industrialization to survive. We have to build more industry, we have to generate more employment. What does Pakistan do? It comes up with a top-down industrial policy of directing resources to a small number of business houses to drive employment and industrial growth in a few sectors. And that means the political power of the state is used to deliberately drive resources into the hands of industrial investors. So this is not a free market economy, it's a state-driven economy 
where the task of the state is to accelerate capitalist development by pumping resources into the hands of investors. And the mechanisms they used were actually extremely successful. They used mechanisms like overvalued exchange rates, fixing the exchange rate, so that essentially what happens is that the exports of Pakistan were basically raw materials like jute, which were grown by the peasants. By overvaluing the exchange rate, you are helping the importers and you import license, so you, can, you only can import things which the government allows you to import. So imports become cheap. And what are the imports that are allowed? Is industrial machinery. So industrial machinery becomes cheap, whereas the peasant gets less money for exporting their job. So the economics of it is that it's essentially a transfer from the peasant to the industrialist. Right? So the peasant is basically subsidizing by growing jute and exporting it, is subsidizing the import of machineries. And who are the importers of machineries? Are the more advanced capitalists who happen to be in West Pakistan because that's where the capitalists are. Now, I don't think this was a deliberate plan to screw East Pakistan, but that's effectively what happened. So effectively what happens is that resources get transferred from the peasants to the capitalists through things like the overvalued exchange rate, through things like um, different forms of subsidies, and these ex the, the new industrial class get further subsidies to accelerate their exports and um, subsidize interest rates, subsidize land, all kinds of things basically to accelerate industrialization. If you simply look at the growth rates that Pakistan achieved in the 1950s and 60s, it was hugely successful. That strategy of hot housing development by pumping resources into industry at the expense of other sectors was hugely successful and in the 1950s and 1960s, Pakistan grew extremely rapidly. I'll give you some figures of how rapid the growth was in a second. But this strategy had two flaws. One obvious, one less obvious. The most obvious flaw was that the easiest place to develop the capitalists was in the West Pakistan. That's where the bureaucratic and the financial and the entrepreneurial capabilities were. So who were these people? They were the immigrants from India, like the Habibs, like the Saigals, like the, you know, the, the big business houses of, it, of Pakistan. So basically immigrant Gujarati Muslim capitalists who located themselves in um, West Pakistan and through them the Spanis. And through them, a, alliances with Punjabi capital and Punjabi traders developed. So the big business houses of the 1950s were essentially non bengali Muslims not all of them even Punjabi, a lot of them were Gujarati and immigrant Muslims into Pakistan, like the Spanis, the Saigals, the Dawoods, and so on, who came and who set up their uh, business houses, but mostly located in, in the West. So the problem here was the politics. <coughs> the politics was that the majority felt increasingly deprived, politically isolated, and economically screwed because resources were growing from the peasants of the East to the industrialists of the West. No question about that. That's what was happening. The second problem was that to be sustainable as a long-run strategy, it's not enough to give resources to capitalists. You must also have the ability to discipline these capitalists. You must also have the capability to put conditions on what they do with this money and to take their resources away when they're not performing. So just giving money to rich people, you will drive some growth, but sooner or later, if you, if you lack the capacity to discipline your capitalists through regulations, through um, imposition of conditions, then ultimately you have crony capitalism. And Pakistan suffered from both those sorts of problems. So if you look at the, the growth rates in, as you go from the 50s to the 60s and to the mid-60s, all of the figures are trending upwards. Yeah. So in the 1950s, Pakistan is the most backward part of India, lowest per capita incomes of India. Um, by the mid-50s, growth starts accelerating. By the first half of the 1960s, 
Industry is growing at double digit rates. Right? So 12% a year industrial growth rate. Um, and GNP goes from almost zero growth to around 3, 2.7%, 3% growth. Okay? That's the GDP per capita um, growth rates. And the 5% growth rate of GDP in the 1960s was higher than India. So actually Pakistan was doing better than India in that period by its very specific strategy of pumping resources into the high growth sectors at the expense of everybody else. And even East Pakistan didn't actually do too badly. If you look at the growth rates of East Pakistan in manufacturing from the 1950s onwards of industry, by the early 60s, East Pakistan has double digit growth in manufacturing and industry. Okay. Now, the problem though is that this is not by and large owned by Bengali Muslims. The industries that were setting up in East Pakistan are also owned largely by non-Bengali Muslims because they are the capitalists, they are the entrepreneurs like the Ispanis, the Dawoods and so on who also set up jute mills and textile mills and cotton mills and uh, other kinds of enterprises in East Pakistan. So East Pakistan is growing rapidly but East Pakistani capital is not growing rapidly. Okay, so the growth rates are high and, and in a sense the growth rates being high provoke even more anger because people can see prosperity but they are not directly participating in that prosperity. So actually growth creates more tension in the 1960s precisely at the time when growth is accelerating and this is a paradox. Why would tensions increase in the 1960s when growth is accelerating? In a, the tensions accelerate because people see growth but they say where are the Bengalis? Where is the Bengali capitalist? Where is the Bengali the entrepreneur? Or the, bureaucrat or the military guy, they are nowhere to be seen. Effectively, when you do the sums, there is a transfer happening from East Pakistan to West Pakistan. And the way economists do this is by looking at what percentage of your GDP is transferred. And transfer is basically looking at the net foreign capital inflow. Capital inflows are a combination of aid and private investment into a country. So if you look at the first column in the 1950s, West Pakistan was getting 5.6% of its GDP as a capital inflow. That is basically the transfers into West Pakistan from aid, foreign investment, but also transfers from East Pakistan. Whereas East Pakistan was losing 1.7% of its GDP every year, basically largely as a net transfer to West Pakistan. Because what it was earning as foreign exchange by selling jute was not coming back to East Pakistan, it was going to West Pakistan to buy the machineries for the industrialization. So that 1.7% of GDP rep represents the gift that East Pakistan was giving to West Pakistan to buy the machines which was driving the industrial world. Okay. As you can see, that declines, the transfer declines very rapidly. So in the 1950s, it's minus 1.7%. So East Pakistan is losing 1.7%. By the late 50s, it's become less than 1%, 0.7%. By the 1960s, there is a net inflow into East Pakistan, but the inflow into West Pakistan is much more. West Pakistan is getting 5.4% in the 1960s, East Pakistan 0.3%. So East Pakistan is not losing out, but East West Pakistan is getting most of the net inflows of aid and resources, and is still getting, in a sense, an unequal deal. It's only in the late 60s that it is corrected. In 1970, for the first time, East Pakistan gets more inflow than West Pakistan. The problem is it's too late. By then, politically, East Pakistan is lost because politically people are just pissed off with the unequal um, development. But East Pakistan is not lost for Pakistan. In 1970, the East Pakistanis don't want to leave Pakistan. But what is lost is the constitutional arrangement which gives the West Pakistanis the ability to extract resources from East Pakistan. That is lost. And I'm going to come to what happens. Because 
What the East Pakistanis want in 1970 is exactly what they wanted in 1947, which is to use their political power to correct the economic imbalance. Right? So, in, so in 1970, they wanted to use their political power to correct this imbalance, not just to make it 3.2 and 3.1, but to make it 5 into East Pakistan and minus 1.7 into West Pakistan. So you actually have a transfer from West Pakistan to East Pakistan to correct the previous inequality, right? So the objective of the East Pakistan in the 1970s was not just parity, but to use their political power to say, right, now we are the boss. Okay, now economic development has to develop East Pakistan and not West Pakistan. The problem was that that threat that the East Pakistanis would actually become the rulers of Pakistan fractures Pakistan. Just like that threat fractures Bengal in 1946, it fractures Pakistan in 1971. It exactly the, the parallel mirror image of these two stories. This is another set of figures which, um, let me just say, this is figures for industrial investment, and it basically supports what I've already said. So this is the actual millions of rupees invested in East Pakistan and West Pakistan from 1961 to 1970. And if you look at the two gray rows, there's the figures for West Pakistan and East Pakistan. In 1961, West Pakistan was getting almost four times or more than four times the investment of East Pakistan. 852 million rupees compared to 205. Right? So in 1960, Investment, industrial investment in West Pakistan is four times higher. By the time we come to 1970, it's almost the same. 1061 in West Pakistan, 700 in East Pakistan. So you can see the trend. The trend is the political pressure results in increasing investments in East Pakistan because the Pakistani state is trying to respond, but it's too little too late. And there's a more fundamental problem here. Most of the increase in East Pakistan is not driven by East Pakistani entrepreneurs for the simple reason that East Pakistani entrepreneurs don't exist. There are no big businessmen in East Pakistan. So most of that increase in investment in East Pakistan is the public sector. So the public sector is 45.7% of investment in East Pakistan in 1970 compared to 3% in West Pakistan. Now, the public sector is also run and driven by bureaucrats from West Pakistan. So, there is a lot of investment happening in East Pakistan. See a strategy of promoting these people to come forth, and they didn't do that. And there, the political imbalance and the arrogance of the West Pakistanis has something to do with it. So, the failure of Pakistan is, has a number of dimensions, but one dimension is that it didn't devise strategies to correct this inequality. And the inequality was not just an income inequality, the inequality was an inequality in entrepreneurship. That there was no strategy of creating the entrepreneurs in East Pakistan who would try to grow, who would create jobs, who would be seen by East Pakistan as either our people and therefore we are also benefiting in this growth. That's a very serious problem. And so what was the East Pakistani political response? Very interesting. As early as 1954, the United Front, of which all the political parties were, of East Pakistan were united in this except the Muslim League. The Muslim League is wiped out. The one and only election that the Muslim League wins is 1946, for very specific reasons that I've discussed. In 1954, the United Front comes in, and the United Front demands not the breakup of Pakistan, not independence, but actually going back to the cabinet mission plan. It wants to have federalism. It wants to have autonomy so that East Pakistan has control of its economy, leaving defense, foreign affairs, currency to the center, but taxation, spending, and economic resources become state issues. This was not just the cabinet mission plan. This was also the Lahore Resolution of 1940, which was tabled by none other than Fazul Haq, an East Pakistani politician. Okay? So this is the root of the Bengali political mobilization against the centralization of power in West Pakistan. 
It was demanding federalism, which was exactly Jinnah's own demand against Congress. This is the real irony. Jinnah demanded federalism, and Congress said no. Now the East Pakistanis were demanding federalism, and the center was saying no. The history of India, you can write it as a history of failed federalism. And actually what you see today in India, with the states becoming increasingly uh, intransigent and blocking everything the central government does, is really that process unfolding into the rest of India. But unless you can work out forms of federalism in such a diverse country, it doesn't work. And that's basically what, what happened. By the 1960s, that 21-point program of the United Front had become the six-point program of the Awami League. And this was a six-point program that resulted in the Awami League's victory in 1970. What is a six-point program? Very few people have read the six-point program. The six-point program on which the Awami League won the 1970 elections was not a program of secession. It was not a program that was anti-Pakistan. In fact, it referred to the Lahore Resolution as its source of legitimacy and says the Lahore Resolution gives us these rights. Okay. So the six-point program traces its history directly to the Lahore Resolution, mentions the Lahore Resolution, and says that we want to have um, state-based economic powers. On that basis, as we all know, the Rami swept the 1970 elections. It swept the 1960, sorry, 1970 elections. It got 160 out of 300 seats in the entire Pakistani National Assembly. It therefore could form the government of Pakistan. How far can you get from secession? They wanted to be the government of Pakistan. They wanted to become the government of Pakistan, to rule Pakistan, to correct the imbalances, and to construct the federalism which would give East Pakistan its rights. And just as in 1946 and 1947, the Hindu minority says, no, thank you very much, we don't want you. The non bengali Muslims in 1971 said, thank you very much, this isn't going to work. You cannot possibly be serious that you are going to rule Pakistan when you are the nobodies. I mean, you have no industry, you have no army, people, you have no bureaucratic personnel, you have no education, you have no... What is your... Bhutto comes along, Bhutto, the guy who is... presents himself like Nehru as a secular, democratic, you know, uh, person of Pakistan. Bhutto comes in 1971, insists that the victorious Awami League should make concessions about what the constitution will be before they can take power. Obviously, Mujib says no thank you. Why would the victor set limits to what they will do after he has won the election? He fact, the positions on both sides are, and the Awami League position after, in, in the, as 1971 unfolds, moves into a more confrontational, confederal position, that we want confederation and not even going to discuss any preconditions for taking power. And we know the history after that. Right? As the position is hardened, as the army league becomes more confederal, as Bhutto becomes less tolerant, the army crackdown happens of March 1971, and basically after the army crackdown of 1971, it is virtually very difficult to imagine how you can go back to the basic point. Something Dramatic would have to change after that because it was a very um, emotionally and psychologically cracking point after the 1971 March events. So here is why I think that you know even if there was no Indian intervention, even if India did not milk this to the maximum advantage, because obviously India had a national strategic advantage to split Pakistan. There is no question about it. India had a strategic interest in splitting Pakistan. The point is that had there not been this internal problem, nothing would have happened. Right? So India took an opportunity which was there and it took it. Okay, so what is the, the story? What might have happened differently in Pakistan? With hindsight, you can concoct various hypotheses about what might have happened. It's not very useful perhaps. But 
One counterfactual one can think of is what would have happened if the Pakistani political leadership had been more aware of the political unsustainability of having the majority not developing. Had they spent a lot more effort in trying to build Bengali capitalism and Bengali entrepreneurs, what happened after 1971 in Bangladesh, had it happened before 1971 in Bangladesh, had we had the broad-based development of industry and so on that we are beginning to see today, had that happened in the 1950s and 60s, maybe things would have been different. It wouldn't have been easy. It, wouldn't have been, it would have been possibly very wasteful to give a lot of resources to people who were not entrepreneurs, who had no business background, who didn't know how to do things. But it may have worked. The second um, counterfactual to imagine was what if Bangladesh had, or East Pakistan had been given greater autonomy from very early on? If the federalism plan of the, the 1954 United Front had been adopted in the 1950s, that you have a federal union with East Pakistan running its affairs as, as an economy, West Pakistan running its affairs as an economy, basically two quite different territories, quite different cultures and levels of development, but united in some kind of common security, military, and um, currency agreement. Maybe it might have worked. So these are counterfactuals. It's not the, 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 there's no going back to that, and there's no going to say, you know, I'm not saying this that this is a plan for the future, but I'm saying that those were missed opportunities of the Pakistani leadership for which, if anyone is responsible, they are responsible. What happens in independent Bangladesh is extremely interesting. It's a different lecture. I don't have time to uh, go into it now. But what happens is that if you have economic space and opportunities in a, in a country where you don't yet have capitalists and entrepreneurs, what happens is what Marx called primitive accumulation. You have a lot of grabbing of resources by people who are not yet productive, but who have the political power to grab resources. That process of theft and corruption and primitive accumulation is happening all over South Asia. And it happened in Bangladesh in a very intense form after 1971. And through that theft and resource capture and capture of abandoned factories and all kinds of very, very ugly things, the Bengali Muslim capitalist class has begun to emerge. Now, this took a long time to happen. It was extremely wasteful. It is still quite ugly to see it happening. The theft, the waste, the corruption is mind-boggling. But through those ugly processes, I mean, human beings can't devise very nice processes for this, so it seems. Because the emergence of capitalism always seems to involve a huge amount of theft, corruption, and, and graft, and all kinds of horrible activities. But basically, you, a new elite class emerged by the 1980s in Bangladesh, and they drove high levels of growth in manufacturing in sectors like textiles and garments and pharmaceuticals, and now in, in things like shipbuilding, where Bangladesh is building uh, a lot of capacity. And that growth of the entrepreneurial class, a, a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class, is very interesting because it's, first, it's the first time in history that there is a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class in modern industry. I'm not talking about spinning and weaving in the Mughal period. Modern industry, this is the first period when we have a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class, wasteful and ugly as these processes are. And they are driving a new pattern of growth in Bangladesh, which actually Bangladesh has now a higher growth rate than Pakistan for the last 10-15 years. Because it's been driven by a from below grassroots capitalism, ugly, corrupt, etc. that it is. The one lesson that we need to learn from this Pakistani strategy is that there are advantages in state policies of driving capitalist development. And I think that in Bangladesh we can do even better if our state became better at, with strategies and policies, providing resources to potential entrepreneurs to accelerate the growth that, that we are getting in, in uh, Bangladesh. And if, if you look historically, the growth of Pakistan in the 1950s and 60s was higher than India because of those strategies. But to make those strategies work, you need to have state capacities to discipline these guys. You must have the capacity to remove the support from people who are not performing.
And this is one area in which our state simply lacks the capacity. Now, if you ask me what needs to be done in Bangladesh, what lessons do you learn from the Pakistan period, it is to build those state capacities, to build those agencies and capacities of the state to be able to discipline these emerging capitalists who are still appear to be completely out of control. If those of you who read newspapers and so on will have heard of the Hallmark scandal and many other scandals happening in Bangladesh today, where capitalists who are otherwise productive are also stealing the Bengal Muslim capitalist class has begun to emerge. Now this took a long time to happen. It was extremely wasteful. It is still quite ugly to see it happening. The theft, the waste, the corruption is mind-boggling. But through those ugly processes, I mean, human beings can't devise very nice processes for this, so it seems. Because the emergence of capitalism always seems to involve a huge amount of theft, corruption, and graft, and all kinds of horrible activities. But basically, you, a new elite class emerged by the 1980s in Bangladesh, and they drove high levels of growth in manufacturing in sectors like textiles and garments and pharmaceuticals and now in, in things like shipbuilding where Bangladesh is building uh, a lot of capacity. And that growth of the entrepreneurial class, a, a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class, is very interesting because it's, first, it's the first time in history that there is a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class in modern industry. I'm not talking about spinning and weaving in the Mughal period. Modern industry, this is the first period when we have a Bengali Muslim entrepreneurial class, wasteful and ugly as these processes are. And they are driving a new pattern of growth in Bangladesh, which actually Bangladesh has now a higher growth rate than Pakistan for the last 10-15 years. Because it's been driven by a from below grassroots capitalism, ugly, corrupt, etc. than it is. The one lesson that we need to learn from this Pakistani strategy is that there are advantages in state policies of driving capitalist development. And I think that in Bangladesh we can do even better if our state became better at, with strategies and policies, providing resources to potential entrepreneurs to accelerate the growth that, that we are getting in, in uh, Bangladesh. And if you look historically, the growth of Pakistan in the 1950s and 60s was higher than India because of those strategies. But to make those strategies work, you need to have state capacities to discipline these guys. You must have the capacity to remove the support from people who are not performing. And this is one area in which our state simply lacks the capacity. Now, if you ask me what needs to be done in Bangladesh, what lessons do you learn from the Pakistan period, it is to build those state capacities, to build those agencies and capacities of the state to be able to discipline these emerging capitalists who are still appear to be completely out of control. If those of you who read newspapers and so on will have heard of the Hallmark scandal and many other scandals happening in Bangladesh today, where capitalists who are otherwise productive are also stealing resources, and some of this theft can be productive, but a lot of it is unproductive, and the state is unable to discipline them. And that has very serious consequences. And if anything we learn from the Pakistan period is that if you are unable to discipline your capitalists, then the whole growth strategy becomes unviable. So you need, we need to develop the capitalist sector, but we also need to discipline them very hard. And again, we are making some of the mistakes of the Pakistan period. The capitalism is developing, but it seems to be out of control. We don't have any limits on it, we don't have any distributive constraints on it. And that's for the money. And the Pakistani problem was that it tried to do too much given the state capacity. It tried to develop too many sectors, tried to have too big transfers from agriculture to industry. It didn't have the monitoring capacities, and a lot of it went wrong. Ironically, this is again something people don't know. The Pakistan period, Pakistan's industrial strategy in the 1960s, was a model for many other countries. The South Korean industrial policy of the 1960s was based on the Pakistan model. The South Koreans sent their economists and their um, planning commission people to Pakistan, funded by the Americans, because at that time the US was the patron of both South Korea and Pakistan, they were close US allies. 
The U.S. actually financed South Korean economists to come to Pakistan to learn this thing called industrial policy. The irony was that the South Koreans learned to do industrial policy, but they had the capacity to discipline their capitalists. So when they subsidized their big industries, it was exactly the same strategy. They gave resources to a small number of big holding companies to drive growth, just like Pakistan's 22 families. But then you have a very successful um, <coughs> discipline which trans transformed South Korea from a country with a Pakistani per capita income in the 1960s to an OECD country today. <coughs> so it shows that if you can use these kinds of strategies with strong disciplining and strong governance capacities, you can. Now, I'm not saying that we can become like South Korea by any means. I'm saying we can do better than what we are doing. The chaos of totally anarchic theft and looting that is going on produces a few good capitalists, but it also wastes a lot of resources. And if you can combine the support for capitalist development and entrepreneurship and so on with better governance of that sector, I think the outcomes will be much better. And that's one of the lessons that I take from the Pakistan um, experience. A couple of slides before I finish on what lessons of this I mean, uh, period that we For me, the main um, lesson, ironically, you know, because the whole failure of Pakistan was in its pattern of industrialization and movement in the world. But that strategy was, in one sense, extremely successful in promoting and, and accelerating industrialization. The challenge for Bangladesh today is precisely how we move up the value chain, how we diversify our industrial base away from garments and textiles to these new sectors like shipbuilding and pharmaceuticals and iron and steel and so on. We don't have an industrial policy strategy in Bangladesh. We have very bad memories of industrial policy because we think of industrial policy as the bad Pakistan experiment. We are excessively reliant on a kind of free for all, free market, winner takes all kind of open economy. That also doesn't work too well. Right? So I think we need to have the, the one lesson that we learned from the Pakistan period that I learned as an economist is that there are huge advantages of being able to push the capital sector, but I'm repeating myself because it's an important point. You need to have the capacity to, to govern. And our history here, in terms of our development banks, the Shilpuri Trostar Shilpur Bank, has been extremely bad. We have not been able to discipline lending to the private sector. We have not been able to discipline the private sectors. I mean, again, the Hallmark scandal that is happening today, I mean, a couple of guys have looted 3,000 crore takas from, you know, one public sector bank. I mean, this is unbelievable levels of looting going on. So we need to think very hard about financial instruments, how you finance development, how you discipline that, and how you link your financing with social objectives. What kind of capitalism do we want? How do we want to spread entrepreneurs regionally across Bangladesh? Should, I mean, we should have balanced development across the different districts. We should have balanced development between small scale and large scale. All of this requires governance capacities to finance development. And this, is extremely important. There are also some very important political lessons that I take from the Pakistan experience. The first is that we need to move away from this pointless and destructive discourse on Bengali versus Bangladeshi nationalism, secularism versus Islam, this and that, and, and so on, which kills us. These are based on misreading 47 and 71. If you read 47 and 71 correctly, with historical evidence and actual data on what happened, both 47 and 71 are based on the same political problem. That is, the majority wants to exercise its political power, and the minority stops it. And before the minority stops it, Bengali Muslims were neither Muslim nor Bengali. They were just people. It's when someone stops you from exercising your power, then you become violent, sectarian, separatist, whatever it is, right? But till that happens, actually, we should be proud of our history that Bengali Muslims always wanted 
to be the unifiers. We were never a separatist. Whereas our political culture celebrates different kinds of separatism. Either we are Bengali separatists or Muslim separatists or some other separatists. And that results in unnecessary conflict between those who say no Muslim separatism is problematic and those who say no Bengali separatism is problematic. The problem is that we were not that. And the, and the attempt to rewrite this history in that way, both historically wrong, but also makes us fight ourselves because neither of these histories rings true. Our own memories are not like that. So when you try to write a history with something that doesn't ring true, you create conflicts and you create fights because people don't believe you and they think you are trying to rightly. They think that you are trying to exploit them and, and um, use them for some other purpose. Now, Amelie did not fight the 1970 elections. The United Front did not fight the 1954 elections on a demand for either Bengali nationalism or secularism or anything. Its program was an economic program. We want our economic rights. Why do we have to write this story as a fight between secularism and Islam? It was not. That was constructed after the event. That whole story that we were fighting for secularism against the one league is not a secular party. If you look at its history, it's a direct descendant of the Muslim League. It's the same people. The Muslim League itself is not an Islamic party because the Muslim League itself wanted to stay in India as long as the rights of people who happen to be Muslims were respected. So equally, it's the Muslim League in 1947 who voted for the unification of Bengal. Now, if you want, so how can you explain that if you believe that the Muslim League is a separatist two-nation party? If it's a separatist two-nation party, the Muslim League would have voted to Parish and Bengal to get this pure Muslim law. It did not. So the Muslim League is not Muslim separatist, and the Awami League is not Bengali separatist. This is our misreading of the history. And if you read the history properly, you will not waste time having this debate. And I think it's very important for us not to waste time. But here is a issue which I think is quite important and dangerous. Because of this discourse between Bengali nationalism and Muslim nationalism in the world, in which the Awami League and certain groups in Bangladesh, the left in particular, from its misreading of history, take this position that the country has to be saved somehow from Islamic fundamentalism. That the alternative to Bengali secularism is some kind of Islamic fundamentalism, which has never been the conflict in Bengal historically. We ally ourselves into the protection of India to preserve our secularism. And India has absolutely no interest in Bangladesh's secularism or anything. Let me put it even more bluntly. The nightmare scenario for India, absolutely nightmare scenario for India, would be for Bangladesh to merge into India. Because if Bangladesh merged into India, you would get back to the problem of Curzon's Bengal of 1905. That is, everywhere from Bihar to Nagaland would be Muslim majority. This is a nightmare for it. It will never allow it, which is why it has built a 4,000 kilometer fence around Bangladesh to keep the Muslims in. If you wanted to absorb Bangladesh, you would not spend $5 billion building a 4,000 kilometer fence to fence you in. So anybody who thinks that India is about to take us is completely wrong. Anybody who thinks that India has any other interest in Bangladesh except to control Bangladesh for its own interest is also wrong. So, the discourse which says that somehow to preserve secularism, we have to ally with India and its integration with India, which is in our long run interest, ends us up in very damaging economic choices. And I'll give you an example of this very damaging economic choices. A couple of examples of this very damaging economic choices. A couple of months ago, the head of the Chamber of Industry of India, the CII, Mr. Adi Godrej, comes to Bangladesh with an investment plan. Maybe you have seen this in the press. Absolutely astounding investment plan from the Indians. What is investment plan? They want the right to set up 
Indian companies inside Bangladesh on the borders with Northeast India. They will produce things in Bangladesh to sell to the Northeast. They don't want to pay taxes in Bangladesh. They will not import or export in Tatas. They will not give this to any part of it to the Bangladeshi exchequer. Why is that in Bangladesh's interest? I mean, the last thing we need is to go back to replacing Punjabi Muslims with Punjabi Hindus. I mean, the whole fight in Pakistan was that we were not in control of our industry, we were not in control of our entrepreneurs, and now we are welcoming a different group of entrepreneurs who now say they will solve the problems of Bangladesh. We haven't learned our history. I am not against foreign investment. I am not against foreigners coming and investing in Bangladesh. But not on these terms. Not on these terms, the terms that Adi Godrej comes and asks in Bangladesh. There is nothing wrong with integration if it is equal and mutually beneficial. So if an Indian comes to Bangladesh, on the same terms that Bangladesh should be allowed to go to India. But if a Bangladeshi who puts a foot into India is shot because they have crossed a fence, and the Indian can come into Bangladesh, this is not an equal arrangement. Now the problem of, of demographics is that the same problem that affected the partition of Bengal in 1946 still exists today in India. The Hindus of our neighboring states do not want to live in a Muslim majority area. Therefore the fence, therefore the border shootings, that's fine, that's not a problem for us. We do not have to be the enemy of somebody who doesn't want to be with us. In 1971, the Pakistanis didn't want to be with us because they didn't want to be in a Bengali majority of Pakistan. That's fine, we don't have to be the enemies of Pakistan. We just have to understand the history. And if you understand the history, you will understand that it is a mistake to write our history as this big conflict between Islam and secularism. The real issue is how to develop our people, how to develop our economic rights, how to develop a broad-based productive capacities in Bangladesh. How to increase our education so that we are not educationally backward. How to increase our industry in different sectors. And the question then becomes, if we are trying to do these things, on what terms should we negotiate with India, Pakistan, China, whoever else wants to come? If you write your history as a kind of epic battle between secularism and Islam, India is our ally, Pakistan is our enemy, or the other way around, epic battle between Hinduism and Islam, Pakistan is our friend and India is our enemy. You are wasting your time, you mistreat your history, and you end up with another set of allies who are not really your allies, who didn't want to stay with you. Neither the Pakistanis nor the Indians wanted to stay with us. That's the take home message, right? Bangladesh is independent, it has these borders, because neither the Pakistanis nor the Indians wanted to stay with us, not that we didn't want to stay with them. And if that is the reality, let's start from that position, develop our country, develop our education, develop and stop fighting each other. This is why I think history is so important for economics. If we don't understand history, we cannot come up with strategies of our national identity, why we exist, what we need to do, how we need to develop the country, and we end up in these pointless fights which are destructive and our Regional powers exploit these differences. So Bangladesh is a battleground between the ISI of Pakistan and RAW of India, each of them pumping in money into different political parties, each of them fighting these pointless battles which do not help our people. That's why the history from 47 to 71 is so important. And indeed the history from 1905 to 47 is so important. We need to understand this history. And that history helps us actually to think about the future. Thank you. Now you may have questions um, or challenge or comment. <coughs> um, thank you for the talk. I heard it last year and I had to come back for the second. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, there's one issue which wasn't really touched upon, maybe it wasn't relevant to the economic side of this. But how much of a contributory factor was the uh, language movement in the separation of the Bangladesh and Pakistan? And uh, also, was um, how much did India contribute to this issue, to the language movement? I think the, the, 
language movement is actually a symbol for the fight between centralization and federalism. The language movement itself is not an independent thing that drove the politics, rather it became important because it was a symbol of the centralization of power. Now, if you want to construct a very centralized state, then that state must have one language. It must have one set of principles about how the state is going to be organized. If you are constructing a federal state with self-government between of the different regions, then you don't need one language. Right? So, Bengali is instinctively understood that if you have one language, it means power is centralized in Karachi, which was the capital at that time. Right? So, if power is centralized in Karachi, and that the symbol of that power is the language, then you must fight it. But actually, you know, the, the issue is, of course everybody likes the language, but was there a language movement in Pakistan? I mean, the Pakistanis didn't speak Urdu either. For them, Urdu was also an important language. I mean, someone who speaks Brahui or Saraiki or Pashto or, or even Punjabi doesn't understand Urdu. It's closer, but it's like, you know, Uriya is close to Bengali. I can't understand Uriya simply because it's close to Bengali. Or, you know, so, but why did the Pakistanis accept Urdu? Because it was in the interest of the Pakistanis to have a centralized language because they were the elites. Right? So it's exactly the same way that, you know, why was Nehru secular? Nehru was secular because playing the secular card came from a permanent majority in Delhi. Why was Jinnah Muslim? Is it because Jinnah prayed five times a day and went to the mosque and was... No. Jinnah was more secular than than them. But why was Jinnah pushing a Muslim identity? Because first past the post meant that Jinnah would never have power in India. And people like Jinnah would never have power in India. And the Muslim elites would be completely cut out forever from Indian politics. Right? Why was Ambedkar pushing the rights of the backward castes and the untouchables? You know the history of Ambedkar, Ambedkar was an untouchable. But he wasn't an untouchable because he converted into Buddhism and left Hinduism. Having become a Buddhist, he still insisted that untouchable should be why? Because, not because it's a religious issue, it's a political issue. If untouchables didn't have political representation in India, they would feel nowhere. Right? So all of these things, whether it's language or caste or religion, they become salient issues because of politics and economics. In itself, it is an issue, but it is not something of, for which you will fight a war, right? And I, our, you know, history that, that you know, some sometimes you read this, you know, Bengalis are the only people in the history of mankind who fought for a language. Nonsense. <laughs> I mean, this is complete nonsense. All wars are for national symbols of different sorts. Um, the, the second part of the question with regards to India, yeah. whether they contributed to the yeah, and I think that there is many dimensions of this. There is a shared culture between um, Bengals, yeah. West and East. And, and if, look, many people in Bangladesh and West Bengal are, don't hate each other, we have a common language, we have a common <laughs> civilization, a common culture. So there is a lot of cultural exchanges. But this was politically used by all sides. Right? So people who didn't want it used it, people who wanted it used it. I don't think there is much mileage in saying whose intention was what. The outcome that happened is because there was a fundamental economic and political inequality. Had that not been there, I think everything else would be... We would be talking about it. So there's no problem in having cultural exchanges with some other place. If your own national identity is not a threat, if your own country is not a threat, when it becomes under threat, and you try to stop that by suppressing cultural exchanges, that won't work. The only way you can fight it is by addressing the fundamental economic and political inequality. So you couldn't have fought it by saying, no, we will not listen to Rohit Rishwami, which was a Pakistani response in the 1960s. Then. So you, you can't do that. You have to say, why are people suddenly becoming more interested in Rohit Rishwami? What is the symbol of it? It's a symbol of your powerlessness. 
Therefore, we have to go back to the roots and say, why, why are people doing this? Not, let's ban the Let's not allow, that's not going to work. Sorry, Professor, can I thank you for being I mean, mindful? Sorry, but that was brilliant. Uh, uh, there's so much of history that we don't know. And you're right, but every time you said, do we know this? We don't. And truly, that was really fascinating. You put into context a lot of things and you put my perspective completely in a different way. But my question relates back to the 47 or 46 question. And the famous you know, about the Bible, and I don't want this small bit in the map. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there also a reference to the fact that, or should we pay credence that it was? The issue of the pockets of Muslims all over what was in India and the potential that there was a division being created by the British in order to put this whole independence into jeopardy. Well, how much credence should we take to that? The independence of India? The independence of India. I mean, it wasn't the whole idea of the conflict. Um, people, historically, we, we always read that the partition was, is a, it was a British creation in order to sabotage the defense. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's completely wrong, okay? Now, the British as imperialists, like any good imperialist, always played a divide and rule game, right? So this is given. So the 1905 partition of Bengal was part of this divide and rule game, but in 1905, there were no votes in Bengal, right? So the Hindu elites, including Rabindranath Tagore, were against that partition because to have that united Bengal was in the interest of the Bengali elites because they were de facto ruling Bengal, but not politically because there were no votes. But the same Hindu elites who were against the partition of Bengal in 1905 were for the partition of Bengal in 1946 because then there was votes and they would no longer remain the elites. Okay. Now, I think that while the British were playing this divide and rule game in the 1920s, 30s, and so on, again, like Rohingya Shongi, if there wasn't a real problem, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. There was a real problem. It was because there was a real problem that the British had mileage in playing this game. Number one. Number two. And here is where I would advise you to read very others. By the line, after the Second World War, the British had been devastated economically. The British objective was to get out of India as fast as possible. On any terms, I mean, they didn't even want to stay to, to solve the problem anymore. They just get out because it had become an economic liability. So as time goes on, Britain as an empire is no longer interested in keeping India. It's no longer interested in playing divide and rule politics. It's looking for an exit strategy. So, by the 1940s, the fight in India which results in this chaos is a fight between Indians. If anything, again, Barry Anderson is brilliant in this, right? if anything, by the 1940s, the British become completely pro-Congress and pro nehru And their legacy, their, their feeling is that our legacy to India is that the first time India was united as a country is under the British. Because the borders of India, as, you, as it is now, with the exclusion of Bangladesh and Pakistan, if you, if you think of the borders of British India, India as a, as a map was a British construction. So the British felt that breaking this up into these little bits would destroy their legacy. So they tried to the end to actually help Congress to somehow find a solution. The problem is Congress didn't want a solution. Congress had done contingency plans of different ways of carving up India so it didn't have to share power. If Congress was willing to share power, partition wouldn't have happened. And the British wouldn't have stopped that because they were not interested in whether India was one, two or three. They just wanted to go. The failure of 1947 was an Indian failure. It was a failure between the Muslim League, the Congress and, and other groups to come to an agreement where you you respect the democratic of forces and you have some kind of end. And again, I mean, I could give you a whole lecture of this, this series of rejections that Nehru and Congress did to every proposal for keeping this thing together. 
I mean, I've just given you cabinet mission plans, but there were many, many proposals, <coughs> many, many compromises that Jinnah was willing to make. What Jinnah was not willing to make is to say that you could, re you could rule this in huge country with a 30% Muslim minority on a first-past-the-post system with power centralized in Delhi. That was unacceptable. Then if you were there in the 1940s, you would also say this is unacceptable. Because you would have meaning in power. Lucky if you got 5% Muslim representation. So the failure of the British Federation was out of nature plus the promise. No, I don't mean, I guess I'm, the failure of the British was to have to be in such a hurry to go out. Actually. I mean, had they said, you know, let's stick it out for another two years, it would be very difficult for Congress to say no, no, no to everything. Because Jinnah was not actually saying, Pakistan or nothing. He was saying, if you have that model of centralization, then Pakistan. And, and at huge cost to himself, because he and his, the entire Muslim League, as I said, the power base of the Muslim League was in the parts of India, which under no conceivable way would become Pakistan. The power base of the Muslim League was in the Muslim minority provinces. The Muslim majority provinces had no Muslim League, they had no need for the Muslim League, they were already ruling. The reason why Jinnah had power is because in 1946, the Muslims in the Muslim majority provinces realized that Nehru was going to take them to the figures. That's when they switched. Before 1946, they were on separate tracks. What Jinnah did was he made it clear to the Muslims that, look, you are walking into a trap. That was his contribution. And when he did that, the one thing which is interesting about Bengali Muslims, you see, is that when we change our mind, we change our mind in our mass, right? So from almost no, I mean, the Muslim League won every seat. And in 1971, from nothing, Awami League won every seat. Right? So when it swings, right, it's a 100% swing. And that's our strength, you know, when we want to do something. <laughs> well, yeah. Just a few random thoughts, but an excellent talk. Uh, we can all take something away, some lessons about, about our past and our present. Um, the, and by talking about us, us moving completely one day, you know, like put it on because the Muslim League in 1996. It reminds me, I think, the, the failure of East and West Pakistan is that, uh, that we have an anti Similarly Similar to, to the Korean South Asian, the Chamber were, well, they were deeply corrupt, you know, they still committed suicide after all these years because of the uh, corruption allegations and all the things that have been discovered about their, uh, about their type of capital. In the current by the United States and Japan. Japan and the United States were part of this uh, capitalism that was created amongst the agrarian of South Korea. This was a peasant nation, no industrial base at all, no industrial nation either. Whereas in West Pakistan, the chairboard of the United States, 21 families, 21 families were actually foreign from the ladies, that Gujarat was almost holy. So they were actually alien to West Pakistan and land itself. And as you know, West Pakistan, or what is now Pakistan, has the difficulty that in fact it's got these, uh, the same family, plus uh, the families created by the Punjabi uh, military. So the supplies and military who, were, who became later Punjabi uh, capitalists, who were also members of the Indian majority. But I think, you know, in some ways, and I think when you, when you, when you mentioned, I think in many ways, Bangladesh's experiment with uh, the industrial development perhaps has a possibility of success the way you described it, in that we do have an identity, as I think what you think of uh, someone else recently, an LC scholar, said actually all the three nations in Bangladesh, Bangladesh actually have been able to find an identity for itself. There is a basis to the population, which probably still doesn't exist in the case of India, and certainly does not exist in the case of West Pakistan. But which is apparently now discovered 
even 60 years ago, of burning the Pakistani flag. But apparently they have never accepted Pakistan at all. Um, and of course, simply, for example, the Urdu speakers who formed the people of Pakistan, who provided uh, the civil servants, the bureaucracy. They were the basic bureaucracy in West Pakistan, and, and Pakistan, East and West Pakistan. Actually, did not. Um, what well, they didn't join the capitalist class. For example, they didn't. They didn't, uh, they didn't actually uh, become investors. Like that. With the result that post 1970, actually they had become part of it, but they no longer necessary in, in the bureaucracy. But Javis want to dominate, and they didn't want it because they had been trained heavily by the Mohajir who was speaking. You know, even in the mosque, the God of Jamaat Islam, which is fine by. Maybe I'm going to stop. Maybe I'm Just one more question. The Jamaat Islam, for example, which was part of the Mahajan, yes. is a fascinating book about this, by the way. How all the mass, the Mahajan, all the mass, switched from being Jamaat Islam to becoming Mahajan only by. You know, it's quite extraordinary. And of course, so later on, Jamal went on to work with ISI in founding the uh, Taliban, etc., you know, with the help of the United States. But I will stop it. Thank you. <laughs> you keep on referring that East Pakistan was not a colony of East Pakistan, or the Pakistan state as such. But your data and um, the structure is more in support of a colonial type of uh, situation related to Pakistan and East Pakistan. This is one point, but may it not follow the normal definition of colonial. But the nature of the state of Pakistan was such that it was uh, not only the perception, but the economically, what you have shown. Indicate that it was partially colonial plan related to Pakistan. This is why. Why do you do that? And the second, you have said historically, East Pakistan, if you didn't want the separation or the independence, but if you remember it, that the Kashmiri conference and Mohammed Bashir saying goodbye to Pakistan, that was the genuine expression of the people. That uh, we can't live in the Pakistan and the state because of the economy that we have very nicely. Mm -hmm. So, basically, historically, it shows that the, the, the Bengalis felt that they cannot stay in the state of Pakistan for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was it, the historical evidence. Mm -hmm. You have not mentioned. That. Okay, so, so the reason why I think I put it in this way is that that's the conventional. Story. Okay. Now, as you say, I mean, a lot hangs on what you mean by a colony. I mean, normally what we think about a colony is someone comes and sits in your country, takes it over, and runs it. That doesn't fit the facts. Because if Kalimran was a colony, it was Punjab was a colony of the Mahajis. I mean, they didn't even vote Muslim League. Right? They voted Unionist Party. We voted Muslim League. Number one. Number two, you see, a 1.7% transfer from one part of the country to another country is trivial compared to the transfers that are happening within India today. Okay. So you could say, you know, Assam is a colony or Nagaland is a colony or Bihar is a colony or someone. So that's not very useful because if you look within the UK, there are transfers going on from the north to the south and so on, which would be in terms of the magnitude of percentages would be bigger than this. So yes, there was a fundamental inequality there was a fundamental inequality in economics and politics, which was unsustainable. Proved to be unsustainable. It may not be very helpful to describe this as a colony, because if you do it, I'll tell you what the problem then becomes. The problem then becomes is, you can't explain the fact that, at the same time that Bhakani was talking about Islam in Pakistan, there were problems. Bengal is at the heart of power of Pakistan as prime ministers negotiating for a constitutional settlement. 
or to take the real government back to work, right? If in 1970, after the election, and who gave this uh, seat allocation of 162 to East Pakistan and you know, out of 300? Is the army. Not consultation area. The legal framework order just gave what Bengalis had fought for for 20 years and didn't get in the, in the you know, constitutional area. The army just gave. The calculation of the army and of the Pakistani elite was that no single party would win 162 seats. Army 160. This was not part of the plan. But imagine had army at that time said or could have reached some kind of compromise with Bhutto. And Bhutto had allowed army to form the government. Would Mujib have said, I have 160 seats in Pakistan out of 300. I will now unilaterally declare independence and leave. I don't think he would. I think he would have been stupid to do that. It would have been the opportunity to correct these imbalances. Within a country, there are always imbalances. Different regions develop at different places. The optimal strategy for Bengali Muslims at that time would have to become the rulers of Pakistan and to gradually correct this imbalance using the resources at that time. Pakistan was doing very well. It had all our industry, so twice we left our industry. In 1940s, the presence of East Bengal developed the industrial base of Calcutta and we left. And in the 1560s, we developed the industrial base of Karachi and then we left. We essentially gave free gifts to Calcutta and Karachi. The rational strategy would have been to not leave in 47 and not leave in 71. But my point is that we didn't want to leave. But the terms on which we had to stay were so unacceptable that we had to. I don't, that's a more complex story than simply saying colonialism, right? It's a failure of working out a constitutional arrangement between different participants in the state where economic and political power is unmatched. And I think it's better to put it that way than to simply say it's colonialism. But aren't you uh, ignoring the geographical fact? Yes, I know the, the geography, obviously I'm not ignoring the geographical fact. As it was constructed, Pakistan is wouldn't have stayed in that form. That was clear also in 1947. It was clear in the 1940 Lahore Resolution. Right? So the issue was not Pakistan. The issue was a constitutional form of Pakistan. Because if you had told Fazul in 1940 that this is what Pakistan will look like, he would say, I don't want Pakistan. But he was the mover of the Pakistan Resolution. So the very people who moved the Pakistan Resolution, the very forces, the Sarawardis and so on, became opposed to it, not because they were opposed to Pakistan, but they were opposed to the constitution. Who is Mujib? Mujib is a direct descendant of the Muslim League. He spent his youth as in the Muslim League. He was an agitator. He was an agitator of the Muslim League. So these are people who, I mean, if you look at the I mean, people who are old enough of the Army League top leadership, are all Muslim Leaguers. So these are not people who are anti Pakistan. They were anti being exploited in the same way that a Welshman might be against being exploited by an Englishman, but isn't against Britain necessarily. Some might be against right. So there are many people in East Pakistan who wanted separatism anyway from 1947. I'm saying they were a minority. The vast majority of people in, in East Pakistan, including the vast majority of the leadership of the Wamili, including Mujib. Possibly by all accounts, even when he was passing through London on the way to um, independent Bangladesh, was still thinking about what confederation he could come up with. This is the mindset of this history, right? You know the history. That Mujib in London was discussing with Bhutto, is there possibly possibility of keeping a link? And he was told by the advisors, absolutely not. You don't know what's happening in Bangladesh. No one will accept it. So I'm saying that this is a history which we don't need to deny. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. We tried to make Pakistan work. It didn't work, period. But we don't have to say that was an external force which came and colonized us and all of us were united and fighting you. This is a wrong picture. I think. But you might disagree, that's fine. Your second question was not about colonies, it's something else. I forgot. You, you raised two. One was about the colonies and you said something else about it. Yeah, but no, that's that, 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 Together. Okay. Now, and then last thing, I just wanted to make a digital thing by 
the nature of the capitals and the working class over the country, that by just disciplining the, uh, the capitalist, you will have a situation which will allow the country to prosper. No. Yeah. No, it's, it's a precondition. So it's it's, 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 it's the inherent problem of the capital. Uh, no, I, I think that at this stage of development, where most of our people are still not very productive, and could not run their own enterprises and could not set up their own self-government and so on. You know, I mean, that's in the very traditional Marxist thing, right? That at this very early stage of development, you need to have entrepreneurs who will drive your roads because not everybody can be an entrepreneur. And this is what we have seen historically. Our problem in Bangladesh is that we don't recognize how backward we are. Even compared to other parts of India, we still lack entrepreneurs, we still lack educated people, we still lack higher education. And we are destroying those things. Right? Our universities have become politicized, our bureaucracy has become politicized, our entrepreneurs are politicized. Everyone is trying to make money through politics, not through actually developing their basic capabilities. So here's a problem, and if you talk to the Bangladeshi elites, they don't even realize the problem. Right? They don't realize how backward they are in terms of, you know, there is no Bangladeshi entrepreneur who could run Reliance or Tata or some of these. So we don't have that middle management, we don't have the job management. This takes time to develop. We are beginning to develop that capacity in the last 10, 15 years or 20 years. Getting Ali Goldrej now into Bangladesh would be a disaster. Okay? We still don't have the capacity to compete with Marwari Capital and Punjabi Capital. If they have free access to Bangladesh, this all will be wiped out. We simply do not have that capacity yet. So that's what that's where you need the state. You need the state which says this is where we are, this is where our competition is, we have to raise our level. When we are raised our level, yes, you can compete. But at this stage, we still can't compete. And that's why we need to develop capitalism. We need to develop our entrepreneurs, we need to develop our higher education, we need to develop the people who can drive growth with strong government policies without wasting resources. Now, you can say it can't be done. It possibly can't be done. But we have to have an agenda, right? We have to have some goals. We have to tell our governments, this is what you need to do, guys. My question was... Excuse me, excuse me, we need to move on. We're running out of time, that's why I saw it. We're just going to take three questions, is it okay? Yes, then, yes. Then finish. You, you, one of them, and then uh, Steven, and then yourself. Sorry about this. Um, I think you mentioned that India had interest in Pakistan in Pakistan, and India had interest in Pakistan, sort of separating. Why is that? Oh, purely strategic defense terms, right? I mean, if you if you have to have a, a I mean a conflict and you can concentrate just on one uh, border instead of two, it's better for you. Um, and <laughs> the other thing is that the northeast of India is hugely problematic part of India for India. The northeast of India is full of people who don't want to be part of India. I mean, if there's a colony anywhere, that's where the colony is. So if you take the seven sisters, right, there are strong secessionist movements in all of them. Separatist movements, internal fighting secessionist movements. If you look at the map, right, there's a very thin piece of uh, territory called Shiriguri, which is called the chicken's neck, and which is about 10 kilometers. And then there's a huge chunk of land on the other side of Bangladesh, which is bigger than Bangladesh. Now, had Pakistan been together and had the Pakistani military been in East Pakistan, they would do havoc in the Northeast. They still do havoc in the Northeast, by the way. Occasionally, they do operate through Bangladesh and, and it just takes a few guns here and there and lots of damage is done. So, India had to get Pakistan out of there. And that's why also India is so keen to keep Pakistan out of there. So, the, an alliance between Pakistan and Bangladesh would be disastrous for India. As far as the Northeast is concerned, that's why the whole debate on transit and so on comes in. So it is strategically very important. India also has huge strategic internal problems. Right? I mean, just as the Baloch don't want to be in Pakistan, the Assamese don't want to be in India, the Nagas, the Mizos, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people don't want to be in India. Forget the Kashmiris. Forget the Sadhis, the Tamils. So, so, so strategically, India had, if I was Indian, I would say this is an extremely important objective. 
is to separate these two out. I think uh, Stephen. Well, Christian, maybe it's part of your question. As a historian, given what you so strongly in the album, do you think that, is it your opinion as a historian, that the formation of Bangladesh or a Bangladesh at some period was inevitable? Or do you feel that before 47 there was a practical, realistic possibility of federalism? Within India, if British had left on them more carefully to swim up. Or not, what you said, if it was ever really feasible for policies within a wider Pakistan to be effective such that there would be this imperative movement towards Bangladesh. The question I have to the last thing I had definitely in the camp. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, the answer to your question, if you ask me, neither 1947 nor 71 were elected. Okay? If, and, and the proof of that is that the people who left didn't want to leave. So if you could have got an agreement which would satisfy the economic interests and political interests of the people of Muslim Bengal, East Bengal, in 1946, at least this part wouldn't have gone, and a similar deal could have been done in, in the West. In the West, the story is actually even more bizarre, right? The Northwest frontier was an alliance with Congress. Congress forced them to go. They didn't want them. If you look at Punjab, the Unionist Party, I mean, Mountbatten forced the Unionist Party out of the Muslim League in because Congress had already made the plan of shutting, shutting these people out. The state of Kala, which became Balochistan, was only integrated in 1973 because it's basically a princely state. So, no, it was not inevitable at all. Okay? And the, the poor Punjabis got an extremely bad deal. And we in Muslim Bengal, the East Bengal, got a pretty bad deal. We lost our industrial base and, and so on. The problem was that the terms that Never was offering were unacceptable, just like the term that Bhutto was offering was unacceptable in 1971. The irony is this, there's a huge irony here, right? The irony is that the centralized model that Nehru wanted to construct for India, for the Indians, has failed. And the centralized model that Jinnah and Bhutto wanted to construct for Pakistan has failed. Not for East Pakistan, has failed for Pakistan. So what you see today in India, is a politics of decentralization going to mark. If you read the Indian newspapers, I mean, there's this debate with the endless new states are being created. Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, now Telangana. I mean, the separatist movements in the north. In Pakistan, I recently found out that there is a plan of splitting Punjab into three. Saraiki land in the south. And then, why? Because the centralized model doesn't work in a highly diverse society like India. The difference between a Kashmiri and a Karnatakan person is more than the difference between a German and a Greek. Right? It's the per capita income difference between the richest Indian state and the poorest Indian state. You are talking about 1.5% transfers. Today, the per capita income of the richest Indian state and the poorest Indian states is, do you know how big it is? 5 is to 1. Whereas, the, the difference in per capita income between Germany and Greece before the crisis struck was 1.3 is to 1. Germany had a 30% advantage over Greek per capita income and the Germans thought the Greeks are all lazy bums. India is a country where the richest state is five times Gujarat compared to Bihar. So what, I mean this is colonialism gone mad. So you have to have some form of federalism in this entity. And the problem for India is that it never spent any time working out what the principles of this confederation should be. And my prediction would be that once India does it, right, it would probably take another 50 or 100 years to do it. But it's going to, it's going to happen. Centralized rule doesn't even work for Hindus because there are too many types of Hindus and there are too many castes and too many languages and too many regions. It's not going to work. You can see it's happening. So as India becomes more confederal, as more power comes to the states, 
as Bangladesh develops and our prosperity increases. One can imagine a situation where 100 years from now, we become more integrated into a federalized Indian Union, but not into a centralized Union. I mean, the centralized Union will swamp us. Okay, and, and, and Pakistan, the movements are in the same direction. So there is a long-term, possibly good outcome that might come, but it's still not in our lifetime. In our lifetime, the strategy has to be to protect Bangladesh's sovereignty and to develop it. Because that's the historical reality, that's what we have. Trying to do anything else today, a badly thought out merger with India or badly thought out integration with India or giving India access unconditionally on, on a one-sided way, would be disastrous for every side and would result in a counter-reaction and a counter-attack, which would be ugly for everybody. So that's what I'm interested in, in preventing. But in the long run, I'm for integration, but on equal terms. And on equal terms, this integration would have worked in 47 and 71. Can you have the last question? Um, when, when you said uh, the campus is need to be disciplined uh, by the regulators, um, there's an assumption there that they're different people. Um, but of course, conventionally, we find them when the regulator, by the government, gets stronger, the whole oligarchic situation even tends to worsen. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you see that resolving? I mean, you're absolutely right, and there's no simple answer, which is why it doesn't happen, right? But the point is that we need to come up with some ideas and program on which everybody starts talking about, and which can make, we will not get to a point, look, the regulators of the U.S. banking system couldn't regulate the U.S. banks. So it's very difficult to regulate. If you have economic power, it, it corrupts political power, it corrupts the regulators and so on. But it's a moving battle. You have to keep fighting this. The fact that you can't do it perfectly doesn't mean to give up time. Right? So we will not have 100% control over these guys. We will not even have 50% control over these guys. But 45% control is better than 2%. That's the fact. Okay, and the fight is therefore to keep on saying so. Regulation not just about capital, regulation of quality. Look at our universities. You know, people are, there was a picture just a couple of days ago of people with a gun, you know, attacking somebody else in the university. Under the eyes of the government, because it's a party person of the army, nothing happens. Even the education minister said this is unacceptable. They can't stop it. The politicization has gone to that extent. This is included in what I mean by regulation, right? You can't solve everything, but why can't we have a tough position from civil society, us, media, everybody? Okay, we can't solve 100 million problems of Bangladesh. Can we just solve three or four? And everybody focus on these four things. Right? So I think you will not get a result tomorrow, you will not get a result in five years or ten years. But if you keep fighting at it, you might get an improvement. And for my point is, if you don't get an improvement on these things, if the doctor who is being trained by the medical college comes out and doesn't, isn't able to operate, sooner or later it will affect you and me. You might be visiting Bangladesh, you might need to have some operation done, and you die in the operating table because this guy got a fake certificate from somewhere. So this is where we are. And I think that the, our voices should be used to identify achievable regulatory targets. And I completely agree with you, they are not easy to achieve, they will be usually. To take the Hallmark crisis. Take what is going on with the Fodda Bridge. You need, we need to come up as, as Bangladeshis with some insistent common demands. We want X, Y, and Z. We don't want in some abstract sense good governance and so on. What is good governance? We don't want this abstract thing called we have to fight corruption and have accountability. This is too abstract. Solve some very specific regulatory problems. And we can live with corruption and, and, and bad governance and the uh, ping pong game between you know, Army League and BNP. That's fine, help them. But can we just get some critical regulatory things? That's much better than talking about good governance, anti corruption, democracy, because those are even more difficult and will take much longer to achieve. Thank you, Dr. Bhai. Thank you for uh, moving class. Thank you everyone for coming to this uh, session. I hope you found it useful and interesting and stimulating and inspiring.
and Swahili. Right? <coughs> Tomorrow we have a session on the Rohingya community. Uh, it's going to be at the IDA store. I think that two or three next two. I think that two is uh, second floor. So do come and bring your friends and, and so on. Um, and we've got uh, something every day. Uh, so please tell your friends and, and, and other people. Um, and there are still some food left. Please finish that before you go. <laughs> you can talk to each other for a while. <laughs> so you have got some dogs <laughs> here. Six o'clock. You've got to discussion. I don't know.